My name is uh, Akash Jani, and I'm a senior analyst here at the Lindley Group. And today I will be moderating our session on security. And this is, uh, personally, this is one of my favorite uh, topics and sessions because very, very rarely do uh, engineers and architects get to play the role of a superhero. But today we'll be hearing from three rock stars in this, uh, um, this, topic, this topic area. And they'll be discussing unique uh, solutions that their companies are driving all the way from data center solutions down to MCUs. So our first speaker is going to be from Marvell. Uh, his name is Ben Levine. He's the uh, head of product security uh, solutions for Marvell, and he's the product line manager for multiple product lines, which include Marvell's Nitrox uh, security processors and their liquid security HSM adapters. Before he got to join us in industry, he was also a research faculty member at Carnegie Mellon and an assistant professor at University of Pittsburgh. So it's my distinct pleasure to welcome Ben Levine and take it away. Thanks, Akash, and thanks everyone for being here this morning. Um, I'm going to be talking about hardware security modules, what they are, why they're important, particularly in the cloud, and what Marvell has to offer for hardware security modules for cloud applications. Okay, so we're going to start off with a little history lesson. Um, hardware security modules have been around for a long time. The first one was called the Atala box, and it was uh, invented by a gentleman named Dr. Muhammad Atala in 1973. And it's really considered to be the very first hardware security module. And it was called the Atala box because it was basically a box, a physical piece of equipment that stored and managed keys and performed cryptographic operations. And it was really uh, a, a, a real innovation for its time and that it provided very strong security for keys and crypto operations, which before this had been done just in, in general purpose computing hardware. Um, so the original Atala box was just a standalone box. It would sit in a bank uh, and be used for various financial transactions, um, often one with each teller. Later versions could connect to mainframes over telephone lines. That's the era that we're talking about here, mainframes and, and plain old telephone service for connecting to them. Um, in 1979, though, there was the first network HSM that was introduced by Atala, and, and that was a big advance. Um, you know, the, the network at that time would be a small network uh, in a, an on-premises uh, situation, not the, not the networks that were associated or accustomed to today. Okay, so that was 1973. A lot has changed since then. As we all know, the computer industry has gone through a number of waves of just fundamental change, entirely new paradigms for computing, uh, entirely new types of hardware and software. You know, everything has shifted uh, since the 70s from mainframes to desktop computers to on-premises data centers, and now everything is moving into the cloud. And that's changed everything that we do with computing. It's changed the technology uh, that we use. It's changed the ways that we can use the technology and the types of applications. So you would think that the HSM would have changed, but actually they haven't changed that much, even as these fundamental shifts has gone, have gone on around them. Um, the, the typical HSM is still just a box uh, that connects to a computer or a network and stores keys and performs cryptographic operations in kind of a static and, and monolithic way. Uh, and that was well matched for the, the computing paradigms of the past, but they're not really well adapted to this new cloud environment that we're in or, or moving into uh, quite rapidly. Uh, so for example, some HSMs still require physical access for some functions uh, in the life cycle of the device, like the, the first time the device is used, or if new key sets have to be loaded, you may actually have to have physical access to the HSM. And that's just not practical in a cloud setting where you have you know, many distributed uh, large lights out data centers. And I think more fundamentally, the, the use model is still this idea that you have this one physical asset that a specific user is using and it's being accessed by specific applications. And that's not the cloud model that we're used to where everything is virtualized thousands or hundreds of thousands of users are, are using cloud infrastructure at the same time. Uh, many different types of applications are running simultaneously. There's just a real mismatch here. Well, let's take a step back though. So I'm talking about HSMs in the cloud. Why, why do we need an HSM in the cloud? Well, there, there's a huge need for security functions in the cloud. 
and it's only growing. So there are, there are more and more applications that need to store keys. They need to perform cryptographic operations using those keys. They need to protect data and applications. They need to authenticate users. Um, and that use of security is only increasing. There are some estimates by analysts that by 2025, five years from now or less, uh, almost 90% of all the data that's used and created in the cloud will require some level of security, whether that's encryption, access control, uh, validation, uh, signed data, uh, any number of different types of security, but 90% of the data will require security. And how much data is that? Well, there are other estimates that there's going to be over 100 zettabytes of data. So 90% of that is 90 zettabytes. I actually had to, to look up and, and see what a zettabyte is. Uh, the little table shows the, the progression from megabytes to zettabytes, but 90 zettabytes is 90 billion terabytes. So I can visualize storage for a terabyte. I have some you know, terabyte drives uh, in my home system, but I, I can imagine one of those being a terabyte. I have a hard time imagining what 90 billion of those would look like, but that's the type of data that we're going to be talking about that needs to be secured. So we need security in the cloud to protect all this data uh, and protect it in a lot of different use cases. So things like secure TLS termination. So that's terminating secure connections from uh, web browsers and other things in the field back to uh, the servers in the data center. Certificate signing. Certificates are used now for all sorts of things to, to validate devices uh, are what they say they are uh, to sign data and so forth. Payment processing, a lot of payment processing is still been being done using traditional HSMs in more of an on-premises setting, uh, but that's starting to move into the cloud. And if you're doing payment processing in the cloud, you need to protect in particular the uh, you know, security information that's related to that transaction, like account numbers and pin numbers and so forth. Data at rest encryption. So the idea there is data that's being stored that's at rest uh, often needs to be encrypted. So it can't be accessed by anyone who isn't supposed to access it. And then there's also data in motion encryption. The idea that as data is moving from one place to another, it also needs to be encrypted to make sure that it's not intercepted and, and read and used for uh, illicit purposes. Um, another completely different use case that's uh, becoming more and more relevant is blockchain uh, and cryptocurrency. These sorts of applications are moving to the cloud and you now have things like HD wallets that need to be protected. I talked a little bit about access control. So it's, it's great if you have all this protected data, but you need to allow people to access it, but you need to do that in a secure manner so that only the people who are supposed to access actually get access. And of course, all of this encryption technology, all of the security uh, rests uh, fundamentally on, on protecting keys. So you need a way to securely manage keys, get keys to the places that are, that are needed, uh, but only those places and only when access is allowed. So lots of use cases, lots of data. Uh, we need some sort of HSM solution in the cloud. You know, let's think about some requirements for a cloud HSM just thinking about the sort of fundamental characteristics of the cloud and how it's used. The first thing is flexibility. So we have a, a wide range of applications that are deployed in different ways. And those different deployment models and user applications have different security models. And when I say security model, I mean, how does the data need to be protected? What's encrypted? Where are we using certificates? How are we authenticating users? All of that is part of the security model, and, and that can vary widely. If you think of all the different types of things that are being done in the cloud, and you know everything is moving to the cloud, you can see that there's quite a diverse range of security requirements. We need a system that's very flexible. Scalability, so that's really huge. We're moving to these just huge hyperscale data centers, uh, you know, many, many lights out data centers with many, many servers in each one, located in many locations around the world. If you're going to provide security for those, you need an HSM solution that can deploy that way. And current HSMs uh, just don't have the scalability. Again, they're designed for this model where you have a, a box that's sitting in an on-premises data center uh, that's being used in a, a you know, it's kind of static and limited way. Um, security. So HSMs have always been secure. You know, that, that's in their name, hardware security module. 
And that security uh, is their reason for being. So obviously they need to be secure, but the cloud prevents, uh, sorry, the cloud provides some, some new challenges. So we suddenly have uh, to protect keys and user applications and data in these systems that are being used by, by huge numbers of users simultaneously running many, many different diverse applications. It's a much higher threat environment where you have uh, many more potential malicious actors and attackers who have access to the same cloud infrastructure. So that's, that's a very different security problem than when you have your HSM in a data center where you're at least assuming or, or hoping uh, that no one who shouldn't has access to that. If you're deploying things into the cloud and it's a public cloud, then you have no control over the people who are using that same cloud infrastructure. So you need to protect against attackers who, who in some sense may be inside the system. So that requires a, a much higher level of security. Performance is important. So we, we talked about 90 zettabytes of data uh, that all may need to be encrypted and, and decrypted you know, on the fly. Uh, we talk about things like uh, transparent database encryption where, where database records are encrypted and decrypted in use. So to support that scaling across many thousands of users requires really high performance uh, security uh, functionality. So cryptographic algorithms will have to be offloaded to special purpose hardware to provide this level of performance and traditional HSMs uh, you know, have trouble scaling to the performance levels that are needed for the cloud. And then finally, centralized management. So we have these geographically dispersed large data centers uh, that you know, need to have very high uptime uh, and they need to be controlled from one location or a small set of locations. So you need some sorts of, of centralized management systems that can work with this dispersed fleet of HSMs. Uh, and you need to do it in a way that they can be managed without needing hands-on access because having to send someone into the Lights Out data center to find a specific server in a specific rack uh, to load a key into an HSM, that, that's just not practical and that's certainly not scalable. Um, and, you know, again, conventional HSMs uh, have much, have pretty limited uh, remote management capabilities and often do require that hands-on access. So if you look at the requirements for a cloud HSM, the model of the HSM as this sort of static box that holds keys and, and performs some algorithms just doesn't map at all to the cloud. So we need to break out of this HSM box and create an HSM for the cloud. Uh, and we really need a, an entirely new class of HSM that's designed from the ground up for cloud applications. And that would, that's what Marvell has in our liquid security HSM. So we designed liquid security HSMs from the ground up for cloud applications. Um, they're offered as a standard PCIe adapter card that can be plugged into any server, uh, just a standard server, server chassis with no specific uh, security requirements or other requirements. And the card itself is a complete security solution in the cloud. And then many of these adapters uh, can be deployed in a large infrastructure and all work together. And I'll talk more about that. So um, our liquid security HSMs are based on uh, Marvell Silicon. So specifically the Nitrox 3 security coprocessor, which is a cryptographic acceleration engine. Uh, it also provides compression acceleration, but it's what provides the performance that's needed for these large scale cloud applications. And then we also use the Octeon 2 infrastructure processor which provides the, the general purpose uh, compute power for running the, the rest of the software and firmware in the system. So Marvell is unique in that we're the only company that's using our own proprietary silicon to build an HSM. Uh, other HSM vendors uh, rely on commodity silicon. And as a result, they can't get the same performance. They can't get the same efficiency. Um, we're able to design our software and hardware, you know, hand in hand to work together seamlessly. And that provides us with the highest level of security, performance, uh, efficiency, adaptability, and so on. And, and that's a major advantage for us. So let's look at these requirements that we talked about earlier. Um, so flexibility was the first one. So liquid security is, is very flexible. Um, it has a, a wide range of deployment models, meaning ways in which the security can be deployed 
into the cloud and in deployed in the, the rest of the system it operates into, whether that be devices in the field or an on-premises data center, um, the, there's no limit to the deployment models. And we have a modular software stack and pieces of that stack can be swapped in and out to, to match the needs of the customer and the application. We have a full toolkit of cryptographic and security functions, uh, pretty much anything that you might need for uh, any security application. So all of the standard uh, asymmetric and symmetric crypto algorithms, all the standard uh, communications protocols and so forth are supported. And it also can work in hybrid environments. So this is more and more common uh, where systems are deployed in a hybrid manner where you have some functionality that's running in an on-premises data center and some that's running in the cloud, potentially in, in multiple different clouds. And liquid security allows a mixture of on-premises and cloud um, functionality that all works together seamlessly within the, the same security boundary. So scalability, uh, one of the other requirements we talked about. So you can just add more liquid security adapters to the system but just by plugging them into standard server chassis. And you can do this uh, in as many servers as you want, in as many data centers as you want, located anywhere around the world. And then liquid security enables these to be clustered together regardless of where they're located um, to work as a same seamless security domain. And you don't need to worry about where things are physically located. They all work together as part of the same system. And then other things that are needed for scale, like load balancing, high availability, uh, fault tolerance are built in with no need for external proxies or load balancers. Security, um, we're certified by NIST to meet the security standard FIPS 140-2 level two, uh, so, sorry, FIPS 140-2 level three CMVP, which is a very high level of security uh, for hardware devices that covers all of our uh, hardware and software. Um, I think I've, I've covered these other points. We support a wide range of algorithms. We have the security boundary that's extensible across multiple data centers, uh, very strong access control and authentication. Secure backup and cloning is really important. If you're going to deploy something at scale, you need to be able to back it up and you need to be able to clone as you add new nodes into the system. But you need to do that in a secure manner or you'll compromise the security of the entire system. And we support secure cloning and backup. Performance, so we use the Nitrox 3 security coprocessor, as I said, which has 64 custom crypto accelerator cores. Uh, it's microcode driven. So algorithms and functionality can be updated uh, while still keeping the same high level of performance. So it's sort of the, the flexibility of software to the performance of hardware. Uh, we can get 35,000 RSA operations per second, 10,000 ECC operations per second, um, 10 gigabits per second, SSL offload, so that's you know, on-the-fly encryption of data in motion, so very high performance. And then centralized management, so we have both a management GUI, which and, makes uh, sense. We're starting to run a little bit over. Would you be able to start uh, wrapping this up? Sure. Um, yeah, I think I'm on my second to last slide. Okay. Um, so we have a GUI, which works for smaller deployments and a set of management APIs, which can be used for larger, more automated settings and we have turnkey management capabilities or customers can use their own. Uh, so just to sum up, um, Liquid Security Platform is the only HSM designed specifically for the cloud. We meet or exceed the uh, requirements for uh, cloud use cases, including flexibility, scalability, security, performance, and centralized management. And the HSM is shipping now in volume. It's actually already in use by all of the major cloud service providers. Uh, and being deployed into private clouds and large scale enterprises as well. So that's it for me. Uh, we will have a breakout session at 11.40. So if you, have, uh, you would like to have more of a discussion about the HSM or see a demo, uh, please join us then. But now I think we have uh, some time for questions. Thanks, Ben. Uh, so I forgot to mention this a little bit earlier, but we will be doing a Q&A session after each, um, each talk. And before that, we'll are so, and we won't be doing the uh, panel session. So I just want to kick things off again. Thank you, Ben, for talking, but uh, uh, joining us today. So you talked about uh, your the HSM meeting the highest level of uh, standards here in the U.S. Does it also meet the EU standards of security? 
So there are a number of different security standards uh, that are out there. And there's uh, EDAS, which is a, a European standard for identity security. Uh, there's common criteria, which is often used for mobile devices. Uh, there are some other smaller scale national uh, certification regimes. But the, the NIST standard, FIPS 140-2, is, is really sort of the, the universal standard that's used and recognized uh, around the world. Some of these other standards are, are more limited in scope. We are looking at some of these uh, for specific customers, but uh, many of these actually refer to NIST. So they say, if you meet the NIST requirements, then you can check off uh, at least some, if not all of the requirements for our, our certification. So we feel that by, by covering NIST, uh, we've got a, a large percentage of the security requirements really around the world covered. Hi, okay, so uh, another question uh, I have is, I see that you guys are using a PCIe interface. Uh, is there a reason you chose the PCIe interface versus a cache coherent interface? Yeah, it was just basically, we wanna keep things simple so it's easy to mm -hmm. deploy uh, the HSM adapter without requiring anything particularly difficult in terms of the uh, chassis uh, or the uh, host software. So PCIe is, is sort of the, the, the simplest thing to use in the data center. Um, it provides the, the performance that we need and it's easy to deploy. Also, so it's a lot of CPUs have their own uh, cryptographic accelerators of some sort or another. What is HSM's, I guess, value add in this situation? Well, there, there's a few actually. Um, uh -huh. One is, you know, yes, there, there is some degree of cryptographic acceleration in, in a lot of modern CPUs, but it, it's not to the same performance level that you can get with a custom security coprocessor like the, uh, the Nitrox chip. Um, also, just being able to perform the algorithm isn't enough. You need keys. So protecting and managing keys is really crucial. Uh, the Liquid Security HSM can store 100,000 keys uh, internally and support more keys stored externally. And CPU-based security solutions uh, typically only have very, very small key stores, whereas we're protecting, you know, again, 100,000 keys in a very secure way and allowing those to be used and managed, uh, keys to be derived and created and, and destroyed as needed in a very flexible way. And then the, the, the final thing is we have our own processor on the HSM, uh, the, the Octeon 2 chip, and that enables us to do things within the secure boundary of the uh, HSM itself without having to worry about other software that's running on that same CPU. And that's not true when you're using CPU-based uh, cryptographic acceleration. Okay. And then, um, so there, uh, we have a question about from the audience. They're asking, uh, how does um, HSM specifically support uh, compliance for uh, payment or payment programs and uh, transactions? Yeah, so um, there are some security requirements for payments, uh, PCI, the payment card industry standards. There's actually a number of standards out there that are relevant. Mm -hmm. um, those were designed in the era of uh, on-premises uh, HSMs in on-premises data centers. And I think there's, there's some active discussion about what is needed in the cloud because it's a different environment. Uh, physical access to the HSM hardware is much more limited than in an on-premises setting. So I think right now the, the, the industry is in a little bit of flux in terms of determining what sort of standards really are relevant and, and what's needed. And I think that's something that will shake out, but doing true payment HSM in the cloud is something that's relatively new. Uh, so it will take a while, I think, for the, the compliance and certification regimes to catch up. So from an architecture perspective, could you kind of discuss how this HSM actually encrypts the traffic using the uh, keys? So does it like the, does it store, does the traffic pass through the HSM or does the HSM, uh, so how does that work? Yeah, the traffic passes through the HSM. So packets of data um, are, are sent to the HSM with a, a key identifier. Uh, of course, you have to authenticate that you are allowed to use that key. Uh, and then the data is sent through the PCI interface, uh, through the Octeon processor to the Nitrox chip. The Nitrox chip does the encryption or decryption, sends it back through the Octeon and then back over the bus uh, to the host processor. Okay. And so when there's, when there's a security exploit found, uh, 
a lot of uh, issues with silicon is you're going to have to patch it with firmware or software. Uh, how does that, if that happens for, let's say, one of the uh, Marvell HSMs, how do you expect it to affect performance? Yeah, so let, let me take a little one step back from that question. Um, okay. So we've we've seen you know lots of of exploits of servers uh, and server silicon, um, in you know going back for years. And one of the advantages of using an HSM is you're now putting your keys and your authentication and, and the things you really care about from a security perspective in a separate module. So even if there's a compromise of the host CPU or the host software, you're still protecting your keys and you're, you're not exposed to the, the full consequences of that vulnerability in the host CPU or server. And if you look at the HSM itself, um, you know, you know, if there was a, a problem found with the security of the adapter itself, um, you know, we have a couple of ways to fix it. I mentioned that the Nitrox chip is actually microcoded. So the, the basic cryptographic functionality can actually be changed and, and patched if needed by updating that microcode, but still allowing for the, the full hardware performance. So there might be some tweak that has a small reduction in performance, but overall you're still getting the performance of these hardware engines. And then of course our, our firmware uh, that runs on the Octeon is, is patchable uh, as well um, to, to fix any you know, security vulnerabilities that might be found. So which co what modes of uh, security does HSM support? And when I say modes, I mean like, is it inline cryptography or is it look, look side cryptography? Um, you know, really, we, we have provide sort of a, a cryptographic toolkit and a security protocol toolkit, mm -hmm. uh, and that can be used for for you know really any security application and, and mode of, of cryptographic operation that you can think of. We're not we're not limiting uh, what users can do. We're, we're limiting access to keys and, and limiting access to the HSM, of course, through mm -hmm. uh, authentication and access control. But you you don't have limitations on how you can use these basic building blocks. And that's part of the flexibility that I talked about that's so important in a cloud environment where there's really you know, no constraints on what people might be trying to do. So uh, there's a lot of similarities between this HSM and uh, DPUs and smart NICs. Are there any intersections and what separates you from uh, that category of silicon? Yeah, I definitely think there, there is um, some connection. I think you can consider uh, an HSM in some sense to, to be a DPU because you're providing specialized data processing uh, where it's the the you know act uh, the uh, processing of data in the the data plane uh, that's really the important part of, of what the HSM is doing and of course there's you know the, the control flow part of it uh, in the Akion itself but yeah at Marvell we're, we're really thinking of the liquid security and the nitrox chips. As, as being part of the overall DPU picture. Okay. And then a uh, very common uh, HSM we see these days is Rambus. Uh, how do you guys differentiate yourself from them? Uh, so Rambus, to my knowledge, doesn't offer a physical HSM product. Mm -hmm. uh, they have uh, IP, mm -hmm. which can be used in chips, mm -hmm. uh, but it, it's not uh, the same sort of you know, scalable solution uh, of, of the HSM, and it's not something that, that a, a cloud uh, company or a, a, a you know, company that has data needs can just buy and, and plug into uh, their servers. The, the Rambus is, you know, is targeting people who are building chips, and there's certainly a place for that sort of security IP, but they're very different markets and very different applications. So in your perspective, um, what are the advantages and disadvantages of using um, adapter-based uh, H HSMs versus integrating it like into the microarchitecture itself? Yeah, a number of things. So um, first off, if you have an adapter-based solution, you can dedicate a lot more silicon to the actual cryptographic acceleration. So you know, we, we get very high performance using the Nitrox 3 chip as a, a standalone crypto accelerator. And in most cases, you wouldn't be able to, to dedicate uh, the silicon area or power um, to that level of cryptographic acceleration. Um, also, we can dedicate a lot of processing power to running the firmware. So we, we just have a lot more resources that are available that are focused uh, specifically on security than you would have if it's embedded into another chip that, that's doing other things. So this is, you know, again, 
uh, physical piece of hardware that's dedicated specifically to security functions. And, and as a result, it has much more capacity and much more performance than anything integrated with. Okay. So while we still have uh, questions uh, coming in, uh, we are running a little bit uh, long. Uh, I want to thank Ben for coming, and I do want to remind everybody, Marvell and Ben will be having a breakout session later today, and I really recommend you guys go visit the session and ask him some of these more in-depth questions, and hopefully you can get the answers that you guys are looking for. Thank you, and really good talk. I really enjoyed it. Okay, thank you. Thanks, everyone. Have a good one. Thank you.